Hey everyone, good to be with you today. Uh, I'm really excited uh, with you to hear from Kelsey. I've gotten to speak with Kelsey just a little bit um, and she has a really rad job and I am quite jealous. Um, so Kelsey graduated from Point Loma in 2014 as a biology student and uh, after a few different work experiences ended up here at the Denver Zoo and she takes care of social or so, social African carnivores and small Asian species. And uh, I guess, Kelsey, uh, you do all kinds of uh, care in all the aspects of um, nutrition and behavior and training and all that. And so I'm really excited to hear what that sounds like. So uh, Kelsey, we welcome you. Excited to hear from you. You're muted. Of course. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, thanks, Evan and Chelsea. Um, my name is Kelsey, and I am a predators keeper at the Denver Zoo, um, and I graduated from Point Loma in 2014. And thanks for joining me today as I show you a little bit about the secret life of zookeepers. Hmm. Why won't it let me hit my next button? Oh, there we go. I have to click it. All right. Um, so before I get into the fun stuff and show you some pictures and videos of animals, I did want to share a little bit about my time at Point Loma and my career path that led me to where I am now. So that starts with the questions, why Point Loma and why zookeeping? So I actually chose Point Loma before I chose zookeeping. My freshman year of high school, my senior mentor on the volleyball team was going to Point Loma. And she told me about the school and I was instantly sold and knew I wanted to go there as well. It was a perfect match because at the time and all throughout high school, I always thought I want, wanted to study to become an athletic trainer. Um, and Point Loma's athletic training pro pro program was super strong. Um, but senior year of high school, uh, after I had been accepted into Point Loma, we watched this whale documentary in my AP biology class. And I realized I don't wanna be an athletic trainer and deal with smelly feet. I want to take care of animals and deal with raw fish and poop instead. Um, so I emailed Point Loma and I changed my major to biology and I was really excited that Point Loma was super close to SeaWorld and the San Diego Zoo. Um, so as a biology major, I was mostly in classes with pre-med students at Point Loma. The main difference was that I didn't have to take OCHEM too. So that was a major bonus. Um, but I turned every project I had into an excuse to go to the zoo. Um, in my sociology class, my semester project studied guests at the gorilla exhibit at the zoo. Um, super revolutionary findings. The, long, the more active the gorillas were, the longer people stayed. Um, in my animal behavior class, I compared dominant and submissive behaviors in the elephant herd at the San Diego Zoo and compared those findings to what the zookeepers determined to be their social hierarchy. Um, I took a neotropical ecology class and I traveled down to Costa Rica with Dr. Mooring and some other students. And we studied rainforests and cloud forests and we set up camera traps. That's where I took that picture on, the, on your left, I guess, of me holding a cane toad. While I was at Point Loma, I also got my first job working with exotic animals at this place called the Wildlife Company up in Vista. So in addition to taking care of over 40 different exotic animals, I also took these animals to different programs at schools or at libraries um, or even birthday parties and taught kids about adaptations and conservation. I also met my husband, Brad Eggers, at Point Loma. So that's him there holding a large boa constrictor at one of my shows in college. Um, I also played volleyball while at Point Loma uh, all four years. And senior year, we were national champions. So hopefully that banner is somewhere in, in the gym somewhere. But after Point Loma, I did what most zookeepers have to do, and I traveled around a bit taking on any internship or any seasonal job that I could get. And the first place that took me right after college was to Colorado Springs at the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo as an animal keeper assistant. Um, so there I worked mostly with zebras, meerkats, penguins, and hippos. 
And in that photo, I am brushing a hippo's teeth with like a really large scrub brush as part of our one of, one of our training demonstrations. After that, I accepted a paid internship at Denver Zoo, um, where I rotated through three different sections during the span of my internship. So I worked with rhinos and hippos, elephants, and then some small Asian animals like otters as well. When that internship ended, I moved back to San Diego and I began working two part-time jobs that had me working seven days a week. One job was at a place called Wild Wonders, which is up in Bonzel. And there I did something very similar to the job I had in college where I took animals to schools and library programs um, and did educational programs that way. And the other part-time job was taking care of the flamingos that during the summer moved down to the water park Aquatica um, from SeaWorld. And that was probably the coolest job ever because I got paid really well and I took care of a bunch of flamingos and a few turtles. It was about like two, three hours of work every day. Um, and then I got to test out water slides and hug flamingos and let guests meet them for the rest of the day. So that was a sweet gig for sure. But halfway through that summer, I was offered my first full-time permanent job at Denver Zoo as a predators and pachyderm keeper. And that has been the role that I've been in for the last six years. So when I first started here, I was working in two different sections. So some days I took care of greater one horn rhinos and Malayan tapirs. And then other days I took care of various uh, small Asian animals like otters, clouded leopards, fishing cats, gibbons, uh, hornbills and cranes, and some reptiles as well. But a few years in, the zoo did some restructuring of the animal department, and so I actually stopped working with the rhinos and tapirs, um, but took on taking care of lions, hyenas, and African painted dogs. Um, and that's what I'm doing now. I'm working with those three social African carnivores, and then some days I still take care of those uh, social or small Asian species as well. So that's enough of my backstory. Let's get to the fun stuff. What do zookeepers do? Um, this name is pretty funny, but in reality, zookeepers, we do a lot. We're, we're involved in every aspect of complete and holistic care for animals that live at the zoo. We are scientists and researchers. We're also caretakers and educators. We're dietitians and trainers. We also have to build things and do maintenance on things in our areas. So my plan for the rest of this presentation is to go through some examples and some stories of the different aspects of my job and animal care. So I'll share videos that will illustrate the excellent care that animals um, at the zoo receive. Um, before I do that, I just wanted to give a little content warning. Um, Evan gave me some great advice before this presentation and he said something like don't censor the science um, but I and I love that but I just wanted to give you a heads up that I'm going to talk about poop I'm going to talk about body parts I have videos of carcasses and reproduction um, but that's the reality of my job so just a heads up and with that we'll start with the first picture of poop um, so the janitorial aspect of my job is a huge piece of what I do. I pick up poop every day. Um, that cleaning is just a huge part of a zookeeper's role. And when I'm working or when I'm talking to people about my job, I get two different response or main responses to this. First, parents at the zoo will see me cleaning and they'll turn to their kids and say something along the lines of, make sure you don't go to college so you don't have to do that. But the reality is zookeeping is a super difficult field to get into and most zoos require that you have a four-year degree in some sort of life science. Most of my coworkers have an undergraduate degree, um, some even have their masters, and we use that knowledge and experience in our jobs even when we clean. Picking up poop may seem like low level, but it's actually super important in our job and the care of the animals. Which gets me to the second response we often get which is, can't you hire someone else to do that part? Well, we could, but what comes out of an animal is a huge indicator of their health and their welfare. It's important that as a zookeeper, I know exactly what goes into that animal and exactly what comes out. Um, 
if an animal's stool is looser than it should be, or if there's undigested food in it, that's huge information that I wanna see for myself. Even where an animal goes to the bathroom or how often it defecates is important. Animals can't talk to us and they can't tell us if something is off or if they don't feel well. And they often hide it because a weakness for an animal in the wild might be their demise. Um, so we as zookeepers need to make sure we're seeing all pieces of the puzzle and we're being observant so we can determine if action or change is needed in their care. Um, in addition to picking up after the animals, we also have to maintain their habitats and exhibits. The animals need care every single day. They need care on the weekends. They need care on holidays and in extreme weather. For example, this winter, um, Denver got over two feet of snow in one day. The entire city shut down, um, but just like healthcare employees, we as zookeepers had to go to work. Once we were at work, it was important that we made sure all of our buildings and our exhibits were safe and any damage from the snow was addressed. Um, the same for the initial COVID shutdown. Denver Zoo was closed for 87 days but zookeepers are essential employees and we continue to go to work every day and give the animals the excellent care that they deserved. Another recent example is Hurricane Ida. So zookeepers at zoos like the Audubon Zoo in New Orleans have what they call ride out teams. And those teams will stay at the zoo during the storms when the entire city is evacuated and they'll take care of the animals and the buildings and make sure that they're receiving the care that they need. Okay. So that's enough about poop and cleaning. Um, the next part of my job I wanna talk about is the creative side. This is where being an artist or a builder comes into play. Enrichment, put simply, is toys for the animals. But all of these toys have a purpose. We use enrichment to encourage natural behaviors, exercise, mental and physical stimulation for the animals. This is an expectation that we have every day, um, but it might look different depending on what goals uh, for behavior we have for that species. So this is Vin. Vin will be an example I use throughout this presentation. So I wanted to introduce her. She is a white-cheeked gibbon, which is a lesser ape. She is not a monkey. Uh, the easiest way to tell that she's not a monkey is she does not have a tail. So gibbons, which are lesser apes, um, all they, although they're like size similar to a monkey, uh, they're actually more similar to great apes like gorillas, orangutans, chimpanzees. So in this video, some of the behavioral goals for this enrichment would include something like visual and tactile stimulation or inspection. Um, basically, we want something novel for her to look at and for her to touch. Another goal would be manipulation. We want her to move and manipulate the different parts of this scarecrow or whatever you want to call it um, so that she can get the different food items that are placed underneath the gourd or on top of the gourd. Um, another goal would be sustained foraging. So we don't, we don't want to just put all her food in a pile and then she can just sit there and eat it. We want to elongate that process that she goes through to find her food and to eat her food. Just like a gibbon in the wild might experience if they were looking for berries or bugs in the forest. Um, the next example is Oscar. He is a sub-adult male lion and he's playing with a hose. Uh, water is a super easy and fun way to enrich the animals. So we can fill pools for the animals like you see here. We can add bubbles to the pools or different scents to the water. We can use the, uh, the hose to play with the animals. Um, oftentimes we use a hose to give animals a bath or cool them off. Um, we have misters that will often hook up either inside the building or outside of the building that we use for enrichment. Sometimes we'll just fill a bunch of toys with water so that they knock it over and it's something different in their environment for the day. Um, this next video is of Hintar. He is an Asian small clawed otter. Um, the otters are probably the only species at the zoo that can have toys that are smaller than the size of their mouth. With most animals, we wouldn't trust them not to eat something like this. I'm gonna play it again because I'm short. Um, but we know Asian small clawed otters natural history and we know their behavior and providing something small like this, like a gem or even a key or a little marble can encourage natural behaviors like manipulation, play, caching um, that we know is natural for this species. Oh, it's going to play it again. 
it's cute. So it's okay. Okay. Um, training is also a way to enrich our animals, uh, but it also allows us to take care of them. So most behaviors that we train have some sort of purpose. We don't call them tricks because they're not. They are behaviors, often natural behaviors that have some sort of purpose in that animal's care. So a behavior could be a presentation of a body part for inspection. So opening their mouth so we can see inside their mouth and see their teeth or climbing the mesh like these otters are doing so we can see the bottom of their paws or their stomach. Um, a behavior like in the middle with the clouded leopard might be jumping onto a bench, which is great exercise or a way for us to assess their mobility. But we can also put a scale on that bench and weigh them as well. And all of this training is done by operant conditioning using positive reinforcement. So if you're a psychology major, or maybe if you took psych in college, you've definitely heard these terms. Um, but basically we don't punish the animals. We only positively reinforce them for what we want them to do. And that should increase the likelihood that they're going to do it again. So just like training a dog, it works very similarly. We'll give the animal some sort of hand signal or a verbal cue or a combination of both. If they do that behavior correctly, then we will say good or we'll blow a whistle or we'll use a clicker. Um, and that is basically, a, it's called a bridge. It's gonna bridge the gap to that positive reinforcement, which in most cases is food. That's the most high value thing we can give most of the animals. Um, if they don't do the behavior correctly though, then we just take a pause and move on to something else. They're not punished. Um, there's no consequence really for doing the wrong behavior. So it's all positive based. So we're gonna show some training videos. So this is Jilin. He is a different otter than we've seen in the videos before, but he is, this is crate training. So we were planning to send him to another zoo in Kansas uh, for a breeding recommendation. He was born in Denver and it was time for him to leave and go to another zoo uh, so he could start his own family. And in order for him to move, we needed to get him into a crate so that he could travel in the car to Kansas. Um, so for months, I trained him to voluntarily enter this crate and he would let me close the door. And this allowed me to get him comfortable with the space and remove the stress of that move. And so when moving day came, we did exactly what we did in this video. I asked him to go in the crate. I shut the door completely and we were able to put him in the car and send him on his way. This is a different otter, Gatsby, um, but this is a large hamster wheel. It's actually made for house cats. So maybe you've seen them before, but this is just a run behavior that we trained for exercise. Another exercise behavior is this uh, pull up behavior with an otter. So she was a little overweight, but we didn't quite wanna just take away some food to manage that weight. So we incorporated a lot of exercise into her routine, which worked really well. And then here is Vin again. So this is just, she's prevent, presenting her fingers to me and I'm just clipping her nails. Um, I can use the same behavior and use a nail file instead if she's got a nail that's long or one that's kind of splintering. So another thing we train all the animals for is injections for vaccinations. So just like you receive vaccinations and your pets receive vaccinations, the animals at the zoo receive those as well. So we'll often train the animal to present their shoulder or their hip along the mesh and then we'll practice touching them and desensitizing them to different sensations and then that way when it's time for a vaccination we can give it to them voluntarily in a training session and remove any stress of having to restrain them or dart them with that vaccination or even put them under anesthesia just to get them that treatment. Um, so this photo I actually took last week when Vin received her first COVID vaccination. Um, it's similar to the human vaccine where there's two doses, um, but it is, it's a different product. So it's not taking away vaccinations from people, um, but we are vaccinating a lot of the animals for COVID because there have been cases at other zoos. Um, so this photo was taken after she got the shot. So she got the shot and she obviously was a little bit mad, but then she came right back and was checking out the syringe. And then this is a video of Tenchi. It's not the best video, so I apologize, um, but she's a clouded leopard, but she's getting a vaccination in this video as well. So she lines up and sits next to the mesh sideways, and then I give her that vaccination in her hip, and then she's reinforced. 
So um, speaking of that reinforcement or that food, next up, I wanted to talk about animal nutrition. So when we're deciding on an animal's diet, we're looking at natural history. We're looking at what do they eat? How do they eat? How often do they eat? How does their body process food and digest food? At Denver Zoo, we're super lucky. We have a nutritionist on staff. So each team of zookeepers will work with him and we'll come up with the best diet for each individual animal at the zoo. So first, um, this is a video of a whole pig carcass that we fed to the African painted dogs. Um, for the most part, the carnivores at the zoo are fed a ground beef diet, and that allows us to know exactly how much food that we're giving them and how much food that they're eating um, because we'll weigh it out every day. The ground beef is a lot easier to train with as well, like you were seeing. It's hard to have pieces of a carcass and use that for training because they're you know, set pieces that you can't break up like ground beef. Um, but we also recognize how important it is that these carnivores are feeding on carcasses and eating things like organ meat and bones and skin and fur. Um, so we incorporate that into their diet as well. These feeds are also great for social animals um, because they can eat together. And as zookeepers, we're watching for appropriate behaviors during those feedings. We're looking for sharing food, but also guarding food. Um, and it gives us a lot of information for animals like African painted dogs who have a social hierarchy. Watching these social feeds can give us a lot of information as well. Carcasses are also great exercise. Um, the pulling and the tugging and the dragging helps strengthen a lot of muscles for these animals. So that kind of goes into this video. This is a, a beef shank basically a piece of a cow that we give. Um, and these are two lion cubs, but you can see really some of that exercise and work that goes into eating these larger pieces of food. Oh, we're gonna play it again. Um, again, another carcass video. Um, this is Ngozi, a sp uh, spotted hyena. She's just eating a whole raw chicken. Um, I think she finishes this in like, two minutes, um, but I cut it down so you have to watch the whole thing, but it's just really cool to see her use her paws and hold it down and pull away those different pieces and engage with the food in a different way. So eating large carcasses and completely gorging themselves in food is a natural process for many of these carnivores. So after an animal would maybe eat a huge prey item, they'd be super full. They might not eat for a few days. It's called fasting. Um, so in the zoo, we'll mimic this as well. So we might fast an animal for a day or just for a meal, depending on their size. Um, but usually when we fast them, we take an opportunity to give them something like a bone. It doesn't have a lot of meat on it. Oh. Um, it doesn't have a lot of meat on it, but it's an opportunity for them to engage with that and chew on it and work on it for a really long time, a lot longer than they might engage with a piece of food um, if they were to just completely eat it. So we'll switch gears a little. Sorry, I'm bad at playing these videos. Um, to a, a little turtle, a different size. Um, so this is a black breasted leaf turtle. This turtle would like fit in the palm of my hand. Um, and it's actually eating a small piece of beef liver and a wax worm. So of course, in the wild, a small turtle like this is not going to be eating beef liver. Um, but this product has been shown to be a great source of vitamin A. So working with the nutritionist, we've determined that vitamin A is something that is difficult for us to provide in food that they like um, to eat here at the zoo. So instead, we just give them two little grams of beef liver once a week. So just like understanding animal natural history is important in determining their optimal diet, it's also important for us as zookeepers to understand their species and various behaviors that may be unique to them. So this example in this photo of these lions, um, someone that's less familiar with animal be behavior may see this and think, oh, they're smiling and they're having fun, or since they're showing their teeth, maybe they think that they're growling or being aggressive. Um, but what's happening here is actually neither of those things. Um, this picture is what they look like when they're smelling. So this this is called a Fleming response, and many felines and equids will do this. So basically, they'll smell something, and then they'll tip their head back and, like, curl their upper lip. 
um, and sometimes show their teeth and that's going to like help them inhale that smell deeper. Um, and it'll cross over this organ they have called a Vomero nasal organ or their Jacobson's organ. Um, and that's going to let them get like a way more, like a way better smell or intense smell of what they're smelling. Um, which in this case is female lion urine. This video is another example of a behavior that might be misinterpreted. Um, this is the only video I have that has sound. So just a warning, um, but I'm going to play it first and then talk about it. Oh, Excuse my voice. Morning. Hi. <laughs> what? You happy? Um, so generally when animals show their teeth, we might think that that is some sort of threat display. Um, and for most animals it is, but with hyenas, um, this showing of their teeth and the squealing is actually a greeting. So every morning when I come into the zoo, uh, this is often how they greet me because they're excited to see me. Um, good morning. All right. So this is another, um, video that I took. So this is lions, um, with, with this video and with a lot of the social animals that I work with, um, that's a huge component in their behavior as well. So we're looking at how they're feeding together, breeding behaviors, different hierarchies, dominance and submissive displays. Um, but with social animals, a lot of times there can be aggression. So this video, it actually went viral because it looks like these lions are having fun in the snow. Um, but what's actually happening is that they're guarding each other. And this led to aggression and eventually to a fight, which is normal. Everyone, they're all fine. Um, and it's to be expected for four male lions that are living together. But it just kind of shows that understanding their behavior is really important in their care as well. So one of my favorite parts of behavior is actually, oh my gosh, every time, reproduction um, and our role as zookeepers in the reproduction process. So in zoos, animals breed naturally or through artificial insemination. And there's many different factors that go into determining what might be the best route for an animal. For example, for elephants, it's a lot easier to move sperm than it is to move an elephant between zoos. So that is what this second photo is. Our elephant team will collect semen from all five male elephants that live at Denver Zoo, and they'll send that sperm to other facilities. But in order to collect semen, you have to stimulate the elephant. Um, and the easiest way to do this is to give them a rectal massage. Um, so it's gross, but it's a huge part of the process. and um, Actually, I think it was the Houston Zoo just had a baby elephant calf that was born from one of our males. Um, so it's a really cool process for sure. But the next few slides, I'm just gonna talk about natural breeding because that's mostly what we have happen with the animals that I work with. So for otters, it's much easier to move otters between zoos. Like you saw earlier, we moved g -Lin to a zoo in Kansas. Um, but for otters, we also generally, lean towards natural breeding because of their social behavior. And um, that is a huge part of their reproductive life and their family planning. Um, in this species of otters, both the father and the mother will partake in childcare um, and the also offspring from previous litters will help as well. So natural breeding is generally preferred for this species. It's also pretty obvious fairly soon um, if otters like each other or not. Um, for example, this video was taken about seven minutes after these two otters were introduced for the very first time. Um, so it makes it easy on us to know if they like each other or if we need to maybe find them a new uh, partner. Lions are generally bred naturally as well. There's a lot of experience in the animal care industry with lion introductions. They are social in nature. The risk of breeding them naturally is fairly low um, and there's plenty of lions in the zoo population. So perfecting artificial insemination techniques isn't quite critical for this species at this point. Um, but unlike otters, it's less obvious if lions get along right away. Um, for example, this male, he moved to Denver Zoo and immediately bred two of our females um, successfully. But now um, he's causing a little bit of drama because they have decided they no longer like him. Um, so mate choice is definitely a part of the process as well. 
The last breeding story I have is actually a success story that connects back to something I learned while I was at Point Loma. So our two breeding age hyenas haven't or hadn't quite seemed to figure out how to breed. Um, they'll show interest in each other, but the female would often lay on her back, which is improper positioning. Um, and the male often seemed scared of her and he would run away when he shouldn't have been. So as our team brainstormed on what we could do to help, I remember learning about giant panda reproduction and breeding struggles um, in zoos when I was at Point Loma. So the zookeepers were struggling to get the giant pandas to want to breed. So amongst some other ideas, one of the things that they tried was they showed the pandas videos of other pandas breeding. I don't remember, but I, I doubt it worked for the pandas, um, but the idea was there. Um, and then knowing that hyenas are far more intelligent than pandas, I suggested this idea to our team. It was easy enough to put a video together, so it didn't hurt to try it. So I created a video, added some strategically selected music, and we played this video for the hyenas regularly. Initially, we saw some really great responses. So like you can see in this photo, they definitely were watching the video, um, but often we would see both of the hyenas extend their penises when they were watching the video. Um, yes, female hyenas have penises as well, and they give birth through them, which is also something I learned about at Point Loma. Um, but the success was about a month later, we actually saw breeding between our two hyenas for the very first time. Um, this video isn't successful breeding, but it's just the best quality that I had. Um, but you can see some of that like timid behavior. He's still a little bit scared of her, not quite sure, um, but we definitely feel like the video worked. And then the best part of animal reproduction is baby animals. <laughs> um, I just put these videos in here because they're cute, um, but with breeding animals, you can get cubs. We've had quite a few lion cubs in my time here at Denver Zoo, which has been really fun. Um, this video actually connects back to the enrichment topic. This was camel hair that was sheared from the camels that live at the zoo, and then we gave it to the lions as um, something for them to interact with. This video, you can see some enrichment as well, um, just various toys that they could play with, um, but really, even when they were doing nothing, like in this video, it was really cute. So I figured I would share some videos of that as well. Okay, so the last part of my job I wanted to talk about is animal health. Um, zookeepers, we aren't veterinarians, we're not vet techs. Um, zoos generally do have their own veterinarians or four veterinarians like we have at Denver Zoo um, and an entire vet team. And, but we're the main contact for that team for the animal's care and their health. So we see these animals every day. We have a relationship with them. We know them best. Um, and because of that relationship and the trust that we build with the animals every day, we're often able to train them, like I talked about earlier, to do more things with them than the vet team can. So we're often the ones that are administering medications or giving vaccinations or even drawing blood. Um, in this picture, we have an African painted dog. We're actually doing an allergy test on him. So similar if you've ever had one done on your back where they draw the grid and give you a little bit of all these things or different testing. That's what we did in that. Um, he's under anesthesia. This lion is getting a CT scan. Um, so the first story for this is Kito. He's an African lion and we noticed that he was holding his eye closed and pawing at it a good bit. So we called the vets down to come and look at him. So we are able to use that training to get him close enough to the mesh and close enough so that the vets could use a flashlight um, and examine his eye. And it was then that it was determined he had an ulcer that had ruptured and the treatment was going to be um, eye surgery. And in addition to eye surgery, they wanted us to give him eye drops. So after the surgery was performed, you can see the stitches in that third picture, which is really cool. We as the zookeepers had to use our, our training with this animal to be able to get him, his face close enough to the mesh that we could administer eye drops twice a day. Um, so that was just a really cool story of working together with the vet team. And then last is Vin again. Um, this video, it's kind of a weird angle, but she is in this holding area off to the side. And then we added this PVC tube that she sticks her arm through and holds. Um, so she was 
diagnosed with diabetes about five years ago. Um, and as zookeepers, we've had to be really involved in her treatment. So the first step when we found out she was diabetic was to alter her diet. We needed to decrease the amount of sugars that she was consuming. Um, and a lot of that was fruit. So unfortunately fruit was her favorite food, um, but we had to continue the training session so that we could do other treatment as well. Um, so we had to come up with a diet and try new food items that were valuable enough to her that we can use them in those training sessions. So we began to feed her things like canned chicken and some worms, um, which she loved. But we also had some things that we tried that she didn't like, um, like beans. She was not a fan. Um, but it was important for those training sessions because we also needed her to start receiving daily insulin injections. So we trained her to present her shoulder to the mesh, and then we would give her that insulin shot voluntarily. Um, in addition to the insulin, we had to monitor her glucose levels, and we can do that through her urine and through collecting blood. So next we decided to train her to urinate on cue and to allow us to draw blood voluntarily. Shockingly, the drawing of the blood behavior was a lot easier to train than to train her to urinate on cue. Um, but although we're zookeepers and we're not vet techs, since we have that relationship with animals, like the relationship that we have with Vin and we've built trust with her and she knows us, um, our vet, tech can't, vet techs can't invest the time that we have with the animals to do that. Um, so we as zookeepers are often trained in on certain medical procedures like drawing blood like this. And this is all, again, it's all voluntarily. She could pull her arm out and walk away at any time. Um, and she definitely has done that as well. So um, it just takes a lot of trust and patience uh, to train the animals, these things. So that was a lot of information. Um, and it was a very condensed version of my job. There are so many other things that I wish I could have fit into this presentation, like welfare and safety and weight management of the animals and species survival plans, guest education, conservation, and so much more. Um, there is so much to learn about zookeeping. I've always said that I would love to teach a zookeeping class at Point Loma or some college because there's just so much to learn and a lot of universities don't offer zookeeping degrees. So a lot of what we learn is just on the job training, um, but it's really cool stuff. And thanks for listening. Uh, we should have plenty of time for questions, but I also just threw my email up there too, in case you guys wanted to email me questions or connect later too. That's totally an option. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kelsey. This is so intriguing and so interesting to kind of hear a little bit about I mean, all of the elements that go into your job. Um, and we have had a couple questions that have come through um, and I'll ask those in it. But I just wanted to start off by kind of asking with all of these things that you have to do day in and day out, all the elements as a zookeeper, how do you know when you go into your day or your work day, what what am I going to do today? Does it depend on the need or is it more of a planned out? Okay, we do this on Mondays or once a month we do this. How do you kind of decide what is needed um, based on the day um, and all the things you're doing? Yeah, of course. I think exactly what you said is, is what it is. Every day is drastically different. We have things that we have to do every day. So when I come in, I know I have to I have to get the animals out on exhibit so the guests that come to the zoo can see them. So that means I'm cleaning that exhibit space and getting them out there. Um, I know I have to feed the animals every day. So I'm prepping the food for that day um, or prepping the food for the next day and feeding the animals. Anytime we're feeding an animal, we're training them. Um, so that is something that we're doing every day. And then all the extra stuff like vaccinations um, or enrichment, that is what can be variable throughout the day. So sometimes we'll decide, hey, today we're going to focus on this goal for all the animals in this section for enrichment, and we want all of them to go swimming or whatever it is. So we would set up pools in the whole building. Um, or some days we'd be like, you know what, we want the hyenas to shred a cardboard box, and we want the lions to have a bone, and we want the painted dogs to swim in the pool or whatever it is, or smell something different. So that can change day to day. And sometimes we have a plan ahead of time and sometimes we don't. Um, and then anything medical is just dependent on if there's a current case for that animal at the time. Um, 
most of the time the animals are feeling great. And that's not a huge part of something that we're doing every day, unless it's a daily mm-hmm. treatment of the lion that had to receive eye drops or Vin who gets insulin. Sure. Yeah. That's so interesting and so cool. Um, we have lots of questions. So I'm super excited. We'll jump in with Sarah's question here. Um, she is saying, what would be important for um, somebody who's interested in transitioning job fields um, to start to kind of bridge that gap? So they're interested in zookeeping, but they had a degree in psychology. Um, would they need to go back to school or would an internship like you did at the beginning of your um, graduate career, I guess, um, after you graduated work, um, what would that look like? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, and a lot of people have taken different paths to work in zoos. A lot of us came and started working here right out of college, but a lot of people I work with had a completely different career and weren't loving it and switched. Um, so I think a lot of job applications require a four year degree, but they're less concerned in what that is. So if someone has a degree in psychology, that's actually super relatable to our field because of training and animal behavior. Um, but other degrees that maybe aren't biology or psychology, I think people are less focused on in an application. They just want you to have a degree um, because a lot of the training is on the job training. Um, but I think any any work that someone can do with animals is a great step in that direction. So if you're in a different field and you still have a job, maybe picking up some volunteer shifts on the weekends, whether that's at a zoo with exotic animals or at a cat and dog shelter um, or at a pet store or anything that is going to get you exposed to taking care of animals, reading animal behavior, understanding um, how to be observant and look for different behavioral cues or physical cues in animal care. Um, And then if that's something you're seriously considering, then yeah, internships would be the next step. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of zoo internships are unpaid and they are few and far between. So moving is something that most of us have had to do in order to get um, a foot in the door and get that experience. And then you just build from there. but sometimes if you're li- if you live somewhere where there's a lot of facilities like San Diego, then you might have a lot more options and maybe you don't have to move for an internship because there might be a lot of things just really close by. Sure. Awesome advice. Thank you. Um, Chad asks, curious if you know which animal is the oldest at the zoo. Maybe mm-hmm. this could be like a two-part question. Which animals typically live the longest? Mm-hmm. Um, and then in the entire Denver Zoo, which, which species is the oldest if you know? Um, yeah, I don't, I, th- we just had this, I'm pretty sure his name was Bob and he was an alligator snapping turtle. Um, and he was over a hundred years old and he recently passed away. And um, I would definitely say like tortoises and turtles can live a very long time. Um, so long that it's hard to even say like what an average is because we don't necessarily keep records that far back or when those animals will come into care, we don't have any idea of how old they are. And there's no, there's no way to tell. Um, Sure. um, I think, so the oldest animal that I work with is Vin and she's 30. Um, This skink in this picture right here, she could be 30 or 40, we don't know. Um, But I would definitely (laughs) say it's probably some tortoise or turtle that's the oldest that's still here. But it's so interesting that, yeah, you don't necessarily have records for tortoises that are over 100 years old. That would make sense. Yeah. <laughs> you don't actually know. You can just have a guesstimate, but interesting. Um, so another question that came in is, uh, do you interact with the zoo visitors? Um, do you do demonstrations or interactions? I think um, this might be an interesting plug to to Colorado, our Colorado event we have on Saturday for Point Loma alumni. But um, yeah, what is your interaction with the zoo visitors like? Or do you focus mostly on um, the animals? Um, I interact with zoo guests every day. So a huge part of my job, I just didn't include it in this presentation, is educating guests. So teaching them about different species and what species these animals are and fun facts about them, um, but also how guests can take action to conserve animals in the wild, whether that animal lives in another continent or another country, or if it's animal species that live here in our own backyard. Um, it's important that we're connecting people to the animals that makes them want to make a change in their everyday actions. Um, 
Typically we have demonstrations every day that are scheduled and are like on the zoo map and we're going out there and we're talking on a microphone about the animals and generally doing some sort of demonstration that either involves training or enrichment. Um, but with changes due to COVID, we're not, we're trying to prevent people from gathering and a lot of the spaces that we have for those, those demonstrations aren't spread out well. Um, so we've been doing more like informal and impromptu demonstrations where we'll get on a microphone and narrate what's happening, but it's very short. Um, so it's kind of like somewhat scheduled, but also just like trying to catch people at the right time, um, as they're coming through the zoo that like, Hey, we're going to toss some food to the animals, um, stick around and watch, but it's pretty like short lived so that people aren't kind of gathering around as much. Sure. Absolutely. Um, and I am curious, you know, especially those who love going to zoos or maybe were animal enthusiasts um, just in general, but don't know a whole lot, aren't zookeepers, don't know the ins and outs. How can we still continue to advocate for animals? Um, how can we support zoos? Um, I know that San Diego Zoo and Denver Zoo are two big ones that, um, you know, what are some ways that we can get involved in that um, arena? Um, I think going to a zoo is the best way you can support a zoo. Just going, you know, your admission ticket is going towards the operation of that zoo, but often going towards some sort of conservation as well. Um, a lot of mm -hmm. zookeepers get involved in conservation work um, because the care that we give the animals here can be translated um, into care that they might need to receive if they're in sort of some sort of rehab facility or if they're be in a reintroduction program back into the wild, um, those animals still need care. Um, or you know, the artificial insemination techniques that we're perfecting are being used for animals that will be reintroduced into the wild. So just going to a zoo um, and being supportive is like the best thing that anyone can do for sure. Um, I think, unfortunately, I think the thing that things that zoos don't do well is telling people what we do. Like people love to hear about our jobs and love to hear what we do with the animals. And when they do hear that, they are generally very supportive of all the work and like realize how awesome the care that the animals get here um, is. I mean, these animals eat way better than I do. They receive so much care, around the clock care. Um, they're spoiled, but people don't know because it's hard to get that information out there. Um, we can do demonstrations on microphones every day. Um, we can put up signs. We can share things on our social media, but it's still hard to get into all of the details of everything that we do um, and get that information out to everyone. I think some of the new shows that have been on like Discovery Channel and Animal Planet and stuff like the zoo and Secrets of the Zoo and stuff like that um, have been really cool because people are actually able to see some of this behind the scenes stuff that they aren't exposed to otherwise. Yeah. And it's great to be able to, I mean, that's just such an amazing way too to support zoos is to be learning and to be attending. I mean, that's, it's a fun way also to learn and support. So that's awesome. Um, okay, Rihanna asked, um, I love this question. I'm very curious. So I did not know this about you, Rihanna, but she has a 40 pound tortoise, um, a Sulcata desert tortoise. I'm not sure if that's, if I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly, um, but she's not interested in any enrichment in anything that they've done um, or tried. So she was wondering if you have any enrichment, enrichment Sorry, enrichment ideas for Sulcata Desert tortoises. Yeah, um, that's cool you have one. I, I worked with one a very long time ago. Um, they're like the third largest tortoise ever. They live probably over 100 too. So oh you'll gosh. probably have it for a while. <laughs> um, the first <laughs> thing I can think of is just like different food items or different ways to pre present that food. Um, if you're putting the food in there every day, um, then maybe they're just walking to the same place. But if, if you move it around, that's going to provide enrichment because they're looking for it. Like maybe instead of giving it all in a bowl, you put a bunch of little bowls and they have to walk, you know, just like they would have to, if they were traveling to find food in the wild, that's also really great exercise for them. Um, I could see like a tortoise probably not being interested in like pushing a ball, but a lot of times what we do when we're thinking of enrichment is like, look at what behavior we want to encourage. So is that manipulating an item? So do they have to like push the ball and it rolls over and then the food's underneath it or something? Um, 
do we want them to climb? Are you like making a little ramp they have to walk up to get to the food? So like, what exactly do you want them to do? And then the ideas can kind of start flowing from there. That's awesome. Her name is Squirt. I love it. <laughs> um, very cool. Um, we just have two more questions I'm seeing here. Um, one is, um, how many zookeepers are on your team? How many um, people does it take to care for some of these animals? And I would maybe add to that too, you have mentioned around the clock care and holidays and have you had to, uh, how many people are on, are there night shifts? Or, um, and how many people might be on a night shift? Um, yeah. Yeah, this. we have about a hundred zookeepers for the whole Denver Zoo, which is, is quite a lot. Um, my team specifically, there are 10 of us. Um, and there are like kind of five people that work on each side. So there's, you know, five people that work with the small Asian animals and five people that work with the social African carnivores. Um, within that five and five, there's a couple of us that do both, which helps cover weekends and holidays and time off and stuff like that. Um, in terms of those 10 of us, we all have a different schedule. So there's no like there's no common day off and we're never all here on the same day either. Um, so we'll have, you know, someone has Monday, Tuesday, someone has Tuesday, Wednesday off, Wednesday, Thursday, et cetera. Um, and then for holidays, we have to work those as well. So we have to request in advance if we want a holiday off and it's a whole process of like seniority, but also when was the last time you took Christmas off kind of thing that goes into it. Um, mm -hmm. And then at night we do have night keepers as well. So we have two night shifts there. Are, um, for the most part, the day keepers are here like seven, seven to four or eight to five. And then the night keepers come in from 4.30 to midnight or 12.30. Okay. Um, and then there's a, what we call a graveyard shift that's 12 a.m. until 8 a.m. Um, and all of those zookeepers, they're doing animal care as well. Um, and okay. some people like it at night and some people don't. Um, but we have a lot fewer people here at night for sure. Sure. That makes sense, especially if you're interacting with the guests a lot is a big part of your day, um, daytime job as well. Um, yeah. And what, so how, how long have you been working specifically with the social African carnivores and the small Asian animals? Or have you worked with other um, people in, or other different types of animals at the same zoo? Um, or has it been just this group the whole time you've been there? Um, I've been working with the small Asian animals for the whole time I've been here. So over six years, um, the social African carnivores, I started about a year and a half into being here already. So about five years I've been working with them. Okay. Um, when I first started, I worked with rhinos and tapers as well. Um, okay. but just some restructuring at the zoo, um, they just redivided the way the teams were. And so I was pulled to um, one side and kept working with them for a little bit as people were trained in, but then eventually stopped working in that area. Um, and now our zoo is going through another restructure of the animal department. So the two teams I work on are actually getting split up. Um, so I'm not quite sure what it will look like yet, but I might be learning mm new species to take care of. Um, and I might not be working with some of the animals that I have been anymore, which is, is a bummer. You put a lot of time into building relationship with those animals and learning about their mm -hmm. care. Um, but it's also a cool opportunity to learn something new as well. Um, and it's, it's natural kind of for things to change as, as sure. we get new species at the zoo and, um, and animals pass away or we don't have that species anymore. We kind of have to like move things around so that everyone kind of has a similar workload and we're trying to get yeah. similar animals grouped together. The people that are good at birds are going to want to work with all the birds. Um, people that are good at carnivores or primates, um, we can kind of specialize a little bit more if we create groups that are more similar. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, well, one last fun question for you. Um, I had a question come through directly um curious to know the music playlist that you have specifically for those uh, reproduction videos for the hyenas you have any yeah. like fun music <laughs> playlists it wasn't, that you um it wasn't a specific song and i just did like a loop but our female off oh, i was worried she would fall asleep watching the video and i wanted her to pay attention um but I, <laughs> she also in order for them to breed she needs to kind of like be chill so i tried to pick something yeah. that was like 
upbeat enough that it wouldn't put her to sleep. Um, but not like crazy that she would get all ramped up and scare the male. That's awesome. (laughs) That's awesome. Well, um, Kelsey, thank you so much for your time and your work in, um, putting this presentation together. It was so informative and fun. And those videos are so interesting and we're just so appreciative of you. Um, and just hearing about your experience. Um, and I'm going to bring up Evan one more time. And we have an event, an in-person event at the Denver Zoo. So if you're in the Colorado area, he's going to share a little bit about that with you now um, before we head out for the day. Yeah, thanks so much, Kelsey. Uh, really excited for our in-person event on this Saturday. Um, basically, it's going to be an open day uh, beginning at 10. And, you know, you can hang out at the zoo forever long you want. But from... Uh, noon to one, we will have a gathering for our guests from Point Loma and alumni. Uh, we'll be gathering just to have a little meet and greet time with Kelsey uh, at the Zoo Gardens Cafe. So um, you can come whenever you like, but just plan on meeting together at the Zoo Gardens Cafe from noon to one. And uh, we do have a sweet discount uh, for Loma grads, uh, $10 per person, and it's free for children ages two and under. And so I have, I'm going to, hopefully this works, sent the uh, registration in the chat. Um, And we also have a a Facebook event too, that if you want to follow there, that's a good place for information. Um, But yeah, looking forward to seeing you all this Saturday. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Evan. And thank you, Kelsey, again. We are so happy that all of you are able to join us. We really hope you enjoy the rest of the day. A reminder, this is recorded, and so we will have it up. Um, if you missed some of it want to jump in or invite a friend who you think would be interested, we will have that on our page that um, Kimberly put in the chat, pointloma.edu slash Loma Talks. Um, so have an amazing rest of your day. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you again, Kelsey. This was awesome. Bye, guys. Thank you so much. Everybody. Bye.